This Week in Science and Education is presented in association with the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. Visit their website at sccao.ca. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at Laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. It's your host Kevin Kugler. We're here at the Earth Sciences Museum at the University of Waterloo. We're going to learn all sorts of neat stuff today about dinosaurs and meteorites and geology and all that kind of stuff. And here to help me along, as usual, my good friend Colin J. Hey Colin. Hey Kevin, how's it going? It's going great. Got some really interesting stuff we're going to see today. Mm -hmm. uh, dinosaurs, cave bears, all that kind of stuff, but here to guide us along is our good friend John Motes. And John is a volunteer here at the Earth Sciences Museum at the University of Waterloo. John, thanks a lot for taking the time to come in today and uh, give us this tour. It's very welcome. Give us an idea, John, what are we going to do today and uh, what exactly is your role here at the museum? Well, my role here at the museum is to help the curator with the displays. Uh, a lot of what I do is the educational signs and posters that go with the, the various exhibits. Uh, I also help assemble the exhibits and, and plan them. Uh, sometimes it's pretty interesting. For, uh, for instance, a, a few years ago, we, uh, we got a cave bear in a box and we had to, had to put it together, which was a, a bit of a jigsaw puzzle and uh, a bit of head scratching about how to put a tent on, but uh, it, it went together well. So, John, what are we going to look at today as we walk around the museum? Well, the museum has a lot of interesting things. There's the cave bear that I mentioned. Uh, behind me, there are a couple of dinosaurs, well, one dinosaur, a murdersaurus, and a, a pre-dinosaurian reptile, Dimetrodon. Uh, we, have, uh, we have gems, we have uh, lots of very nice minerals, uh, we have a reproduction mine tunnel that we just had put in that's, uh, that I think is pretty impressive. Uh, some meteorites uh, and, and lots of fossils and reproductions of, of various big, mm -hmm. big looking uh, animals. Yeah. Sounds great. Can you give me an idea? We walked around here and like we're in a little room right now. Um, but sort of the, the museum, I hesitate to call it a museum. It, it, the exhibits are sort of scattered all around the hallway. Mm -hmm. So can you give me an idea of, of, of the kinds of use you get from the general public, from students at the school, or at the university, from students in the public schools? Maybe? Like how, is, how is the whole facility used by people? And, and all those groups are, are catered to by the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the people in the university population, the students and faculty, uh, you know, th this is always open still. So if they're just kind of cruising through this building, they can, they can look at the exhibits, spend a few minutes to read a poster, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the general public, uh, the museum is open every day. It's free, and uh, all you have to do is show up and uh, you can look around. Mm -hmm. uh, school groups are our, our biggest customers, and, and, and they're not business customers because we don't charge anything, but... Uh, oh, it's free. Beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So it's love that. Free. <laughs> free's always good. Free's always good. Stay tuned with us. At the very end, John, will let you know how you can come for some free tours here at the museum. Want to do that, fellas? Sure. All right, let's go see some dinosaurs. Okay, so we're, we're actually in an exhibit now, John. I've never been, I've never been in a museum exhibit before. This is uh, actually kind of interesting. So we're standing underneath you said that this was an older source? That's right. Tell, tell me about this, this particular uh, big guy. Okay, this is a reproduction of an Albertosaurus skeleton. This is Western Canada's own uh, dinosaur. Uh, its range was limited to Alberta. Okay. It's a Tyrannosaurid dinosaur, which means it was uh, related to the famous Tyrannosaurus rex. Mm -hmm. And it had the same kind of lifestyle. It was a, it was a fierce predator, right? and you can tell by its, its many yeah. sharp teeth. And, uh, yeah, so it's about how like, it's, it's long here, I'm guessing maybe, what, 25 feet or so? Um, well, they, 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 they grew about 9 meters. Really? Okay, okay. so that's about 20 feet. Yeah, so. yeah, okay. All right, we've got another one here, so let's just take a second and, and talk about, about this crazy looking, um, you said it wasn't a dinosaur now, or right? so you said it was a reptile, so describe me the difference between a, a pre-dinosaur reptile and, and a dinosaur, what makes this stuff different? Well, this, this is, their, their skeletons were different, mm -hmm. so they're, they're not in the same evolutionary lineage. This is much older than the dinosaurs. Uh, for instance, Albertosaurus, which was probably uh, lived between 100 and 65 million years ago. Okay. Uh, Dimetrodon lived over 250 million years ago. Oh, okay. So these guys, the Dimetrodon, probably evolved into the white mammals, whereas oh, the dinosaurs right. came from a different ancestor right. and evolved into dinosaurs. Right. And they, dinosaurs, believe it or not, evolved in birds. Yes. So, yes. Uh, so that it, it was kind of a 
breaking the evolutionary tree. Uh, you often see that metric on in dinosaur films, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they, especially old ones, and they, they show them as dinosaurs, but, but, but they're not. They're right just in the films because they're kind of cool looking. They have a, a sail of the back, mm -hmm. probably used for temperature control. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, John, we're standing in front of what looks like a cave bear. I saw one of these the other day in my backyard and it scared the donkey. I didn't really see one. I don't get really scared. <laughs> so, this is a cave bear, found in caves. Yeah. How many years ago? They lived between uh, 300,000 and 10,000 years ago. They, the range was across Europe. And uh, they, um, they, they have no modern ancestor. The, the closest living bear would be the brown bear. But this was an evolutionary dead end. It, went one way and they died out about 10,000 years ago. The other bears went the other way and, and uh, turned into modern bears. So, and and were, were humanoids living at the time that this bear was uh, around? Well, yeah, yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, um, it seems like Neanderthal man had a religious cult built around these bears because uh, in Europe uh, they found what looked like shrines to the cave bear, uh, using bear bones and things to, to, to build uh, some sort of religious structure. And in fact, there was a, a book and a movie called The Clan of the Gate Cave Bear, which, which used the, the idea of this cult as, uh, as part of its plot. I love that. Now, how would this bear sound if you met him, you know, in the, uh, the back row somewhere? Well, I'm guessing kind of like, <laughs> All right, so John, we're, we're here at a different part of the museum now. We're going to look at the, uh, the you've got some trial bikes here. Some, uh, I love trial bikes. I think they're really cool. So tell us a little bit about, uh, A, what trial bikes are, and, and B, what you have here as uh, specimens. Well, yeah, trilobites are one of, one of my favorite types of fossil, and in fact, uh, they're probably the second most popular type of fossil mm -hmm. animal af after the dinosaurs, sure. because because they're well known, and uh, you know, some of them are, are, are very very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got and trilobites are uh, a type of animal called an arthropod, mm -hmm. and arthropod uh, modern ones are, are insects, uh, spiders, lobsters, sure. shrimp, yeah. that, that sort of thing. So. But trilobites are ancient arthropods. Mm -hmm. They go back uh, over 500 million years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're commonly found in the fossil record. And uh, in fact, they're, they're used to date certain types of rock because mm -hmm. we know what time period certain trilobites were alive in. Mm -hmm. And we can say, okay, this trilobite's present, therefore this rock is 450 okay. million years ago. So, so what are we looking at here in, in this uh, case? Well, well, one of the interesting ones here is, is this big one. This is a, this is a large one. Of the largest trilobite ever found. Uh, it was found in, in uh, Churchill, Manitoba, and it's uh, it's 445 million years old. Wow. And uh, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's probably what, sort of two feet long. Yeah, and, and something like that. that's what I would guess. So over it's over a foot wide, so probably 40 centimeters wide or so. Mm -hmm. That's massive. Yeah, and, and you can imagine if you're if you're wading along at the beach mm -hmm. and you stepped on one of stepped these, on it would be guys. it'd be a bit of a surprise. Right. Anyway. Look, at, there's some of the other things that are here as well, like this, this crazy looking guy here. And, uh, now, these are these all trilobites, or are there different things in here? Most of them are trilobites. Okay. Um, over here, we have uh, horseshoe crabs, okay. which are they're modern crabs, but, right. they, but they look very ancient. Uh, but I, I've been to a beach where these things were okay. kind of common. Now, are, are they ancient, or are they sort of? Well, they, they are ancient in terms of they. they like they've they, existed they, as a they, species they existed for, a for, time. for a long, long okay. time. And and what what we think happened was a 15 kilometer meteorite mm. struck the Earth at the, the Yucatan Peninsula, which is uh, in Mexico. So, yeah. And uh, you can, this is kind of a fanciful image uh, that, that NASA did up, and yes. it shows a, an asteroid hitting the Earth. This, this is much, much larger. Yeah, that, that was bigger than 15 kilometers, yeah. but you get the idea. But yeah, it gives the idea. Sure. And, um, and, and this created a 200 kilometer crater. Right. But uh, more importantly, it ejected a massive amount of and heat sure. uh, into the atmosphere, right. and this this caused massive climate change, and that was responsible for the, the death of all these life forms. And it's um, but in, in, in the geological record, it's, it's a very very distinct boundary. And um, one, one of the ways this was identified is there's an element called iridium, which is is common in meteorites, but not in the Earth. And there's a very thin layer of iridium uh, deposited worldwide. At this point 65 million years ago. So that led to the idea that this was generated by a meteorite that struck the earth, generated a vast amount of dust that settled to the earth, creating this, uh, this iridium layer. And that's one of the neat things about geology is looking at different layers, kind of almost like pages in a book, and peeling them back, and each page is different. And so you know when, when
when the layers changed and something important happened, right. geologically speaking, between those, those pieces of time. Mm -hmm. So you look at each layer and try to figure out what happened. In this case, a lot of fossils below, different fossils or less fossils above, shows that this, this is an event in time where some of these things happen. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's, it's the process of science digging into these things and things in So it's, it's very interesting to actually see uh, one of these little samples of, of the KT boundary. Mm -hmm. First, very cool. Thank you. Okay, well, this is, this is actually an, an active hallway in the university mm -hmm. that we have converted into a mine tunnel. Wow. And uh, the idea is to, to look like a mine, a silver mine from mm -hmm. Cobalt, Ontario in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And we uh, had a company that, that specializes in making sets like this go up to Cobalt and they took castings of the actual rock and then they made, uh, they, they molded panels out of, uh, out of cement. And, it's actually like rock, and this is, this is real wood. So the idea was to, was to make it as, uh, as, as genuine as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did great. It has a really good feel to it. All right, we're now just in a slightly different spot. So um, we've got some equipment, obviously. So is this real? Where did this come from? Yes, this is, this is real uh, mining equipment from, from Cobalt. Uh, mm -hmm. these, are, these are mine carts, and they were used to, uh, to haul the ore uh, mm. around in the mine. Wow. The Cobalt, Ontario. Where where is that sort of geographically speaking? Uh, it's it's northern Ontario. It's um, sort of sort of halfway between uh, the north shore of, uh, of uh, Georgian Bay right. and, and Hudson's Bay. Okay, so it's up up that way yeah. north of like Sudbury, those kinds of places. Oh, yeah. Far away for it. Okay, great. Now I'm seeing over here you've got like a, a replica of a cage, or well, it's a cage, it's not a replica. Uh, what would this sort of represent in terms of the mine? You use this this mesh and these these bolts to stabilize the uh, the walls of the mine because mm -hmm. you know you, you, you cut the mine with explosives. Yes. But you know there's there's tremendous uh, stress in the walls sure. and they're also they're areas of weakness. Okay, so another piece of equipment here we've got this machine gun looking uh, apparatus. What what is this? What is it used for? This is called a stoping drill. Okay. Stoping. And this stoping, yeah, which is which is a uh, basically you cut a, a shaft in the top okay. of an existing mine top. Right. And the stoping drill was used to, to make the stopes. And what you would do is you drill in with the drill, mm -hmm. it would create a hole, right? And you pack that with explosives and blow it up, and that would uh, that would generate. So like a thing like a jackhammer that you see on the street. So this is the kind of thing that goes upwards instead of downwards. That, that, that's right, and, and you're correct. It, it isn't like a, a, a carpet drill that yeah, turns yeah, this yeah. one yeah. right out. So it's hard, a lot of hard work. Okay, we're we're in a very cool uh, little room here. What exactly is this room that we're in right now? Jim? Yeah, well, this is a, a, an attempt to reproduce a, a mine geologist's office from, okay. from, the, from the same time period as, as our mine tunnel. Mm -hmm. And what we did here is we just put some artifacts in here that, that would uh, you know, show some of the things that they, they, mm -hmm. they did and that they used. Here's a, here's a mining helmet. Wow. So when, when the geologist went down in the mine, he put the helmet on. Uh, it has a, a lamp a on lamp it on and then a belt that holds a, holds a battery well, pack. That's the battery pack, yeah, yeah. These are these are drill bits mm -hmm. that are, are used for, for exploration. Uh, you know that that drill bit that just cuts a hole. Right. This drill bit. Oh yeah. It, that's for for, it's, for making the cores, right? That, that's right. It's a, it's a diamond drill, so there's there's diamond well, embedded see, in there. You can see them sparkling. And it this turns, and as it turns, it cuts a core. Right. And so you would cut, use these cores to, to look at the geology because, of course, if you're, if you're drilling into a, you know, a mass of rock, right. you don't know what's down there. Right. Uh, but you get the core and you can... Uh, like drilling through a tree to look at tree rings. It's the same that's idea. Right. Exactly the same. Used in rocks. And over here, these are, these are smaller Some cores of the on a rock. Right. So, John, here we are standing in front of what I understand is a monolith. Tell me a little bit about that. What is a monolith and how did you get such a massive structure here inside the world? Well, a monolith is just a big flat piece of rock, and uh, we didn't so much get this in the building, we just built the building around the room. Uh, this is a 9 meter slab of a type of rock called Nice. It's spelled G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, but it's pronounced Nice. And uh, it's from a quarry near Sudbury. And it was a from the quarry, shipped down here. Uh, so the concrete base was passed before it. And then it was lowered by the crane, the foundations of this building, before the rest of the building was built. Okay, so speaking of visiting here, uh, um, what would a teacher or a student or a member of the public have to do in order to come and visit uh, here at, at Museum John? Well, if you're a teacher, what you should do is call the University of Waterloo mm -hmm. and ask for the Earth Sciences Museum. You'll okay. be put in touch with the curator, 
and then you can discuss with him uh, what your needs are. Uh, there are a number of, of talks that he does, okay. uh, and if none of those are suitable, uh, he can custom tailor something, mm -hmm. but he needs a few weeks warning sure, to, to do any, anything that's, uh, that's custom. Uh, as for a member of the general public, uh, the museum is open weekdays. Uh, as we said before, it's free. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's right in the middle of the campus, mm -hmm. so it's a little hard to get to. So even a member of the public, the best thing might be to call the museum, talk to the curator, and get directions on sure. how to get here. And uh, once you're here, you can just wander around and, and see what you to see. Awesome. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to take a little bit of a break, Kevin. We know we got to thank we our sponsors, and then we'll be back in a few minutes talking to the student about uh, education and the outreach and a little bit about her educational experience just here at Waterloo. So we'll be right back. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Student Shine Brighter. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. Okay, well, welcome back. We're here with uh, uh, Kathy Fike, who is a third year, you said? Third year uh, student here uh, at Waterloo. Um, a lot of questions for you, but one of, one of the main things that we wanted to talk to you about is, is you do some of the outreach programs in the museum. We've just been spent touring around this morning, and you get to, to talk to the little kids and, and do presentations with, with them and do some of the activities. Give me an idea of sort of the, the kinds of things you do when, when classes come in uh, to visit the museum. Well, um, it's normally one or two classes at a time. Mm -hmm. And typically we have grade fours who do rocks and minerals. And a lot of kindergarteners do the dinosaur program. Okay. But we do have all ages and all kinds of different programs. Okay. And they come in and I do a talk for usually half an hour or to an hour, depending on the age group, sure. and then we do activities. Okay, so when you do a talk with, say, grade fours, what kind of things do you, you talk about? Um, usually that's the rock and mineral mm -hmm. presentation, so I have a presentation on rocks and minerals, and okay. I go through it on PowerPoint, okay. talk about uh, what rocks we use, right. and then I pass around minerals to samples and rock samples. Okay, and then you see so you do hands-on activities. So with yeah. the rocks and minerals, what do, what do the grade fours get to do with, with rocks? Um, well, we usually do a scavenger hunt for information around okay. the atrium. Okay. Sometimes they do the fossil fissure activity. And, and then, which is, what's that? Uh, it's a piece of a fossil, and they're, I think, 60 million years old. Wow. And they scratch away at the top layer, because mm -hmm. it's a soft rock, and try and reveal the black fossils underneath. Um, so how would somebody in grade 4 react to, to actually working with fossils? They're really excited about it, usually. Wow. We have people who just sit there, and they want to keep coming back to do the fossil. And right. They just, yeah, they have right. a lot of fun. Cool. How often do you do the pro the, uh, the programs here? Uh, um, it's usually how many people call in, mm -hmm. so we can do about two a day. Okay. And sometimes it is that busy, other times it's not too busy. How many of you are there that do some of these programs? Usually there's me and Peter, the museum curator. Okay. But I was his co-op student for eight months, right. and now I'm back at school, so okay. I fit it in between my classes right now. So, okay. What kind of other co-op opportunities are there for geology students? There's lots. There, you can work in a mine, you can work um, analyzing what they take mm -hmm. from the mine. Mm -hmm. um, the possibilities are really endless. Okay. Tell me about, um, being a high school teacher, I'm always curious, tell me about first year. I know it was three years ago. But tell me about first year and kind of the things you learn about whether or not you were ready for first year or not. Right. And what should students who come into a first year science program or geology program be thinking about as they're preparing? It was the most difficult year. Okay. I'd say just remember, you have to get your basics down. Mm -hmm. So do the calculus, the chemistry, the physics, right. and just get that done. And then afterwards, you do a lot more earth science courses. Okay. And in first year, you only do three of the ten courses are earth sciences mm -hmm. related. Mm -hmm. But it gives you a background in everything you need. Right. Because so you end up doing geochemistry, geophysics. Mm. And one of the things we've often talked about on, on this show is the, the interdisciplinary nature of science. So you're talking about geophysics and geochemistry. Those aren't the things we teach in high school, right? No. We teach physics, we teach chemistry, we teach earth science, if, if you're lucky, in a school that offers it. Um, maybe part of the difficulty, or you can answer this, is part of the difficulty, the marriage having never really seen that before, of sort of physics with geology. It is very difficult because you're taking the same subject, but at the same time, it's entirely different. Okay. Physics, it's a lot of theory, okay. and you can kind of see how you relate it to real life, like yes. you study waves and sound, mm -hmm. and then in geophysics, you actually put that into the ground and analyze what you find out. Mm. So if you have a certain wavelength, what does that mean? Okay. And how far can you go down and see something? Right, right. So yeah. it, ta it takes it to that next level, not just the understanding about waves and speed of waves, but actually doing something with it. And I think in geology, now looking at say different speeds or different layers, different types of rock, that sort of. So yeah. that's where you get into it and apply some of the physics that you learn in, in a geophysics type. Of for sure. Um, 
I want you to go back even further in time now. Like this would be like this is this is back in the Pleistocene for me. But I want you to think about when you were in high school and the kinds of things you did in high school. Because one of the things that I do is I talk to a lot of high, well I am a high school science teacher and I talk to a lot of high school science teachers and we're always wondering what can we do with our students to best prepare them, best help them to be successful as they go forward in university. So what kind of things, A, did you find really worked for you? And if there was something that maybe either didn't work or, or that could have been done that would help, what, what were some of those things? Um, I found what really helped me was doing a lot of assignments. Okay. I know the students uh, don't like to hear Assignments that. like what? Like what kind of assignments? For math, keep doing those math problems okay. to understand it. Right. Uh, for physics, try to apply it. We got, mm. in my physics in high school, we got to do two projects and okay. we chose what we wanted to do. Yes. So I did one of them, a Rube Goldberg machine, so awesome. really fun. Okay. But the other one was about optics and minerals okay. and how light travels through them. Right. So in that way, I applied it to what I was hopefully going to do. Right. And that okay. helps a lot. And what would help more is if um, maybe you talk to a gui guidance counselor, I never really did, and you get a chance to say, okay, I want to go into this, right. what courses should I take? What courses should I take? Okay. You talked about, okay, we need to do more assignments, and then you talked about hands-on activities, and then you talked about the two that you did that you remember because you did what you wanted and what you chose to do. Yes. Right? Um, what do you remember about the ones you were just told to do? Um, typically it was read from this book, do these questions. Okay. Couldn't relate it to real life. Okay. Very boring. Okay. I had no enthusiasm right. for it. I right. did it, but I didn't enjoy it sure. as much. Sure. Thinking about the kind of student you were, because you just said I had to do a physics project, but I did the optics of minerals because it was something I was interested in doing. Did you always have in your mind, I wanted to study geology, I wanted to get into this sort of a field? Not always. Okay, I, where did it change? I picked up rocks always as a child. Right. Then I dropped a very large size one on my sister's toe. <laughs> my rocks were buried under the porch and I was only allowed to look at them outside and I couldn't pick them up. But I still did. I collected them all the time. Right. And then I guess it was mostly in grade seven mm -hmm. and I was taking physical geology or geography, sorry. Sure. And I wasn't doing very well, so my mother said, "Okay, well, you have to bring the textbook home every night, and we're going to read it." Right. So every night we read that stupid textbook. Right. And it actually turned out to be really interesting. Awesome. I loved it. And Good. then I took geography in high school in mm -hmm. grade ten, mm -hmm. and my teacher, for some reason, kept saying, "Go into geology. Right. You will like geology." You will like it. Right. So I took earth and space science, and I took it early, so right. grade oh, eleven, okay. you took it and down. I loved it. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of takeaways for me from that, right? Uh, Project-based learning. Uh, hands-on learning, student choice, right? And then what I just heard is your mom and your teachers seeing something and saying, hmm, right? But like just the idea of as a kid picking up rocks and somebody to notice that interest. Because sometimes picking up rocks, every kid picks up rocks, but to be interested in it and then have that follow through and somebody notice it and say, well, maybe reading the textbook where you maybe just didn't want to read because that was when you were a teenager and that's the way it worked, right? Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden connections started being made and you had an interest, someone helped you make the connection, and now you're third year at Waterloo? Yeah, awesome. it takes a lot of pushing, but a lot of incentive on your own part too. Yeah. You have awesome. to be willing to do the work. Awesome, that's a great story. Thanks very much, that's, that's wonderful things to share. So here we are back at the Monolith. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank John and thank Kathy for their time here today. And of course, following you as always, you know, who, who joins me on oh. these escapades. Thank you so much. This is a very cool place, you should come and visit if you get an opportunity. I think the last thing we want to talk about is how do we find information about the Earth Sciences Museum and maybe the Earth Sciences Program here. I understand one of you might have a website address for us. Yes, it's www.earth.uwaterloo.ca. Wonderful. Thank you very much again. Again, we'll put that address up in our show notes at uh, tys.vrock.ca. Thanks everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you again same time next week. Take care now.